Today we're speaking with Andrea Stroud, the Supply Chain Research Program Manager for APQC. Andrea, can you tell us a little bit about what you are doing and what you're currently working on regarding um, APQC's recent analytics in the Supply Chain Research Study? Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Dustin. Um, it's always a pleasure to speak with you about our research. Um, APQC is actually a global membership-based organization that focuses on best practices with organizations and benchmarking. And what I do is I focus on developing a research program and conducting primary research and publishing relevant and meaningful content um, for our members. So we've, we've had some pretty exciting research in the analytics area, focusing on analytics in the supply chain. Um, you know, there's been tons of buzz about analytics. It, it's everywhere, especially with regards to its use in the supply chain. Um, and it, an increasing number of organizations are tapping into the power of analytics to improve performance and, and identify improvement opportunities. You know, APQC's recent analytics in the supply chain research really looked at organizations that have an analytics department or program and also how analytics is used to help make decisions that impact supply chains. Um, you know, supply chains are using analytics for a number of activities. So things like creating scoring models for vendor and supplier quality, cost and stability, um, detailed demand forecasting at the level of point of sale, and even safety stock level recommendation. This is just to name a few. And even with the manufacturing groups, uh, we see they're using data to help uh, predict when maintenance is needed for things like refrigeration and air conditioning units. So it's really all very interesting and companies are very excited about it. And do most supply chain organizations have a formal analytics program or structure? Dustin, that's a great question. Um, from our research that we've conducted, three-fourths of the survey participants from our study report that their organization has a formal analytics program or structure. So typically what we see is about uh, a third have a centralized analytics function where there's like a center of excellence that supports the entire organization. And then we see about another third that have a hybrid of both a centralized and a decentralized function. So they have that center of excellence that supports the entire organization. But then there are these subgroups, like, for example, in procurement may have an analytics group or supply chain planning may have an analytics group that are supporting that particular area as well. And those groups tend to report back up to the centralized uh, analytics group. And then about 15% have a decentralized function. Um, what we've noticed is the programs and the structures vary depending on the structure of the company and, and the company size and whatever the needs are. So a good example of this really is from, from oil and gas. Uh, many oil and gas organizations are um, very large and often have a decentralized organizational structure. These are the organizations that often have that hybrid structure for analytics that includes an analytics center of excellence and the decentralized programs or, and or analytics teams throughout the organization. But a problem that is often seen when an organization has a, a hybrid analytics program or structure, and that's that the groups aren't talking to each other and sharing knowledge about their process. So organizations sometimes end up replicating work and investing in areas they don't need to invest in. If you already have those resources in the organization, you want to make sure that they're being utilized in certain uh, skill set criteria, um, training criteria are all being passed down to some of those decentralized groups. So the communication has to has to happen for it to be successful. Can you tell us what are the challenges or barriers to organizations analytics efforts in the supply chain? Absolutely. So you know, in our recent analytics in the supply chain study, we found that supply chain organizations that provided the challenges um, that their organizations were experiencing, there were really top, you know, five top ones that came out. And the first one was really about maintaining organizational momentum for analytics activities. You know, these are companies or organizations that have started an analytics program. However, like to keep people, con you know, uh, continuing to be interested in it and to, to find it beneficial, um, you know, organizations have to keep making sure that they are communicating the benefits of the program and all the resources that are available from it and, and its uses. So that's the first barriers, again, that momentum for uh, analytics activities. 
The second barrier we found was finding the tactical resources. So the people needed to carry out analytics activities. Um, you know, a lot of organizations look outside, but a lot of times they can look right inside their 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 um, inside their organization. And there are a lot of people that have certain analytical abilities. They may not necessarily be at the most advanced level, but these are people who you can train who already have a certain amount of subject matter expertise. So finding that the tactical resources that are needed, you don't always have to go outside, but that is a major barrier for organizations. The third one is executive buy-in, um, you know, getting that approval and acceptance for analytics activities. And, you know, it's a challenge because executives want to see, uh, they, they want to know what those business performance uh, impacts will be for analytics. Um, and you get really get that buy-in through pilot programs. Um, but it's, it's very challenging for organizations initially to get the buy-in. But if you start a pilot in, in either a decentralized group or on a specific project where you're applying analytics, it really helps to get that executive buy-in. And then the fourth barrier that we often see is having the right technology, you know, the tools, the infrastructure in place for analytics to actually happen. And really part of that comes down to making sure that you communicate with your IT groups and you lay down specifications for the data, for how the data is going to be collected, um, how you'll receive the data back once it's collected. So that communication piece is very important and having the right technology and tools is essential. And the fifth and final barrier, um, this came up in our research that financial resources were needed to carry out analytics activities. However, uh, the research also showed that organizations over the past three years um, have actually been increasing their budget. I think the thing that comes up here with the barrier is that even though you're increasing the budget, you have to show that return on investment in order to get continue to get financial resources that are needed for analytics and and to 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 keep that analytics program continuing on. What are the most common type of analytics being used within the supply chain? Dustin, supply chain organizations conduct and use three different types of analytics. So there's descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. So the descriptive analytics really combines your business intelligence with existing data to provide a vision of what's currently happening in the organization. So you typically see things like um, your mean, median, mode, frequency distributions or discrete data points, um, percentile rankings, that sort of thing. And supply chain organizations have reported this is the most common type of analytics that's being used in the different areas of supply chain, and especially for benchmarking projects. And even though this is useful as an indicator of, of an organization's current performance in certain process areas, the descriptive benchmarking does not provide information on why performance is what it is and, and how it can improve. You know, you really find out those things from the predictive analytics as well as the prescriptive analytics. Um, predictive analytics, however, uses historical data um, and various algorithms to predict outcomes of various scenarios to help anticipate, you know, future events and predict trends. Um, it really uses things like forecasting and statistical models um, to help, you know, uh, to form uh, analytics to judge and provide recommendation about what could occur. And when we look at prescriptive analytics, which not as many supply chain organizations are using, unfortunately, um, except for in the supply chain uh, planning area, we do see a lot more of the prescriptive analytics. But in that area, it uses optimization or embedded decision rules to find out what should happen in a certain situation. So this form of analytics is really the most advanced because it uses insights that are actually gleaned from the predictive analytics um, that have occurred to recommend business decisions or, or actions that are likely to produce a specific result. And what enables analytics at an organization? Well, Dustin, that's, a, that's another great question. Um, APQC research has shown that there are really four factors that help enable analytics. So the first enabler of analytics is having the necessary data available and the data has to be a high degree of quality. 
So using quality data will help ensure that you get a quality analysis that will allow for a more accurate interpretation of the data. So without quality data, the analysis is flawed. So receiving data in a, in a timely fashion for timely decision making is very important. Um, many people at organizations have to go through so many hurdles to even obtain the data. And then once they get the data, it could potentially not be in a format that they want or there's something wrong with the data. So there's a lot of question at organizations about um, the validity of the data that they're using for analysis. Um, but an enabler of a good analytics program is, is having that, that accurate and, uh, that accurate and, and uh, timely data. And another, the second enabler is having the ability to, to interpret results and then clearly visualize and communicate those results. So you have to have not only uh, the ability to, to look at the data, to make sense of the data, but if you make sense of it, but you can't communicate it back to the rest of the organization, then it's not very helpful. So you have to really take, uh, make an effort to communicate that back. And a lot of times that's actually done through um, visualization tools or uh, dashboards. A lot of organizations use that to communicate the data and information back so that uh, supply chain managers can make decisions off of it. Um, and then the third, and I had talked about technology tools and infrastructure earlier, but that's our third enabler. It's, it's having that in place is essential and it requires, as I mentioned before, good communication between the business and, and IT groups regarding uh, analytics needs, data needs. Um, it really helps to put the um, criteria of the data in place. And then the fourth enabler is around executive buy-in. So analytics can't be supported without executive buy-in. Um, organizations with effective analytics programs, those are our best practice organizations, they don't just have executive buy-in, but they have executives who are actively communicating the importance of analytics use within the organization. So it goes back to what I mentioned earlier about keeping that communication of the success and what's going on with analytics so that everyone in the organization is aware and they are knowledgeable and they know what they can use and what they can do with the data. Do you have any practical tips for organizations with an analytics program? So I do. Um, APQC's recent study, as I mentioned, had showed that the majority of participants were reporting an increased investment on analytics. Um, and even though there was that increase uh, over the past three years of, of funding for analytics projects and, uh, and, and, and activities, however, when I talk to different organizations, and look at our recent research, it's clear that even though the budgets have increased, many organizations may not be seeing the return on investment that they were hoping for. So I do want to cover some tips um, that organizations can use to help them see the performance and value of an analytics program. So really, analytics programs will want to make sure that the goals and objectives of their analytics program align with organizational objectives. It is through this alignment that they can ensure that you are collecting the right data and analyzing it in a way that will give, uh, you know, help make, help uh, supply chain professionals make business decisions. It's also important for organizations to examine their map supply chain processes and look at where analytics fits into their supply chain process. This helps an organi organization identify any gaps in the process or areas of need. So one thing that we find with a lot of organizations is they haven't mapped their supply chain process, whether it be something like a procure to pay process or source to pay. Um, if those processes aren't mapped, you really can't see where you can include analytics to help support your efforts. So you really have to have those mapped. Um, and one other area, another tip um, for organizations is having the right resources in place. Um, and this really relies on three realms of expertise to make it successful. So you have to have domain experts who can really define the problem and understand what needs to be solved in the supply chain area. And second, you need the analytics experts who know the limitation and possibilities of analytics. And finally, you need data management experts who know where to get the data and what the data means. So 
going back to the analytics expert, when we think about that person, we also should consider what level of analytics is needed and being conducted at the organization. So some organizations have invested in data scientists and statisticians, but are only reporting descriptive statistics that a data analyst could technically report. So you're, you're, you end up spending a lot more money than is necessary for the program or for what you're doing currently in the program. Organizations have to think about the number of analytics people that are needed to be on a more advanced level of expertise versus lower advanced level uh, data analyst or statisticians. And organizations can also take someone on a very advanced level and bring other analysts or statisticians within the organization up to a higher level through mentoring. So again, if you hire a statistician or a, a data scientist and you have others within the organization who have some knowledge of analytics and some analysis capabilities, you can have that person really train and develop those people to conduct more sophisticated analysis. And, and I highly recommend that for organizations because we've seen that to be very effective at best practice uh, companies. And the, the final and very important, important point that I want to make is that for supply chain leaders to understand the impact of analytics um, to its organization, it is important to assess the measures that are being used to evaluate the program and make sure that the right ones have been chosen. So an organization shouldn't just focus on business performance measures such as revenue, cost, um, customer and cycle time, um, even though that is what a lot of our executives uh, like you to focus on. They're important to look at, but that's not the only thing you should be looking at. Um, so you also want to look at things like behavioral change measures. Um, these measures typically help an organization, um, you know, monitor the adoption rates or changes in norms and practices within an organization. They also monitor an organization's use of analytics outputs. Um, to help support the decision making. Uh, behavioral measures that are often overlooked are the number and types of actions taken based on analytics. So you use analytics to call, oh, well, you need to record that and note that because that's really gonna help you determine the success of your program. Um, looking at utilization and consumption or downloads of analytics outputs. So, you know, managers downloading reports based on analysis, that all should be documented um, and tracked. Um, the number of service requests for analytics projects, that's another one to, to track and look at because that tells you, one, are people utilizing um, the services that are offered through analytics and also um, are they finding any benefit? You definitely want to track those things. And the final, the number of employees requesting analytics training, whether it be formal or informal, um, as well as the outcome of that training, that is essential because if you have more people interested in training for analytics, you'll have more people um, doing some, some basic, basic analysis, analysis and, and even learning how to do more sophisticated analysis. It really expresses the need and interest within the organization um, to have that training and to track that information. Thank you for having me, Dustin. It's always a pleasure and I look forward to sharing more information with you on our research in the future.